good evening everyone uh, if i'm audible please send a thumbs up in the chat box So, hello, I'm Simran Kapoor. I'm the state president of IMA MS in Maharashtra. And here we are on our second day of the Breast Cancer and Rehabilitation webinar. With us, we have Dr. Dhanya James. She's a senior occupational therapist, a certified lymphedema therapist, specialist in breast cancer and lymphedema rehabilitation at Johns Hopkins Hospital, USA in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. She has also conducted occupational therapy research study on physical and emotional benefits of dance for breast cancer survivors and has also implemented various occupation-based programs to benefit the well-being of members who have been affected by various forms of cancer. She has also shadowed various clinics in addition to capstones specializing in lymphedema, breast cancer rehabilitation. She is currently working in Johns Hopkins Hospital, USA. Ma'am, you can take over. All right, thank you for the introduction. Uh, Priyanka, how do I start the slides? Ma'am, I'll start it. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. It's 7 a.m. over here in America. So I'm glad we were able to make the time difference work. Um, so thank you for the introduction, you can run. All right, so she said a little bit about me, but just a little bit more. I did my bachelor's at Rutgers University. And then I went on to get my doctor of occupational therapy in Philadelphia in the US. That's where I started doing my capstone on the physical and emotional benefits of, breast, um, of rehabilitation for breast cancer survivors. Oh, oh can you go back? Sorry. And um, currently we're working, I'm working on my master's in health informatics. So that's a different, I've been pivoting my career towards clinical informatics. Uh, Working, I right after school, I went into private practice specializing in breast cancer rehabilitation. I was working in Midtown in New York City. And then just recently, I was called by Johns Hopkins to start running their Under Armour Breast Health Innovation Center. That is on the 10th floor of the hospital. It's a beautiful clinic. They just opened it back, I want to say, in 2018. And um, they, they called me to come down to help um, consult and get the clinic up and running. So it's specifically for breast cancer, which has been great. Um, and there you get to work with some of the best doctors. So it's really been a great experience. And now I am going into upper extremity re rehab and clinical informatics. And please tell me if I'm talking too fast, okay? <laughs> I tend to do that. All right, so our objectives for today. We want to understand the physical and psychological side effects of various forms of breast cancer treatment. And we want to understand the guidelines for recommending exercise and activity before, during, and after treatment. We're establishing a continuum of care from initial diagnosis through rehabilitation. And we want to make informed decisions regarding appropriate recommendations for breast cancer rehabilitation. Now, I'm going to be talking about this from a therapist perspective. And I hope you guys will take something away about how in the future you would like to approach your breast cancer patients. I hope this gives you a little bit more insight into what goes on after treatment and what these patients are in for as they deal with the uh, consequences. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Getting used to this, okay. So when you establish a continuum of care, at the prognosis, you're thinking about what treatments are available, how far has the disease process progressed. This is important also for creating therapy recommendations as it's important to understand the possible side effects of any given treatment. And um, you wanna consider this in your plan of care. So the typical continuum of care, I put an asterisk there, a little star, because this can be very different depending on the patient. Typically, um, for a patient, you'll see a diagnosis. They'll have chemotherapy before or after, sometimes both, before and after surgery. They will have a surgical treatment, which is either a mastectomy or a lumpectomy. 
Uh, a mastectomy is when they remove the full breast or a lumpectomy is a portion of the breast. Sometimes they remove both. It depends on the aggression <clears throat> of the tumor. This is followed by a course of radiation. And then this leads to plastic reconstruction or maintenance or both. So again, we need to know all this information and we have to thoroughly review the patient's chart for clear notes on progression of treatment. And at the same time, we also wanna think about their age, their comorbidities, what they do for a daily living, if they're a caretaker, if they work, they're a working professional on their feet for a long time. Um, what was their functional capacity prior to treatment? So understanding side effects. So as an OT or a PT, so I'm an occupational therapist and um, occupational therapy and physical therapy, which I, I think you guys say physiotherapy, um, we pretty much overlap very closely in this realm of uh, our profession. So we're responsible for getting the patient rehabbed back to their normal life. So, and the key word is normal. Um, after treatment, you'll see there's a lot of different side effects and um, the patient has gone through almost a year of treatment at this point. And then they say, they say, oh, they're cancer free. And now what happens? So um, we're increasing their function to do whatever it is they want, they were doing prior to all this. Okay, so some side effects of chemotherapy. These are a good amount. Uh, pain, fatigue, uh, chemo-induced neuropathy. This usually happens in the fingertips and the toes. Sometimes this can be permanent. You usually give it a year before you see if it's a permanent sensory loss. Um, decreased endurance, cardiovascular changes, uh, increased swelling, which can lead to lymphedema. And... Um, Lymphedema is a very special condition. There's not a lot of research on it, but I will touch up on it in future slides. And cognitive changes, also known as chemo brain. So chemo brain is almost like a brain fog where the person is kind of moving through space with this fog over their brain. So that results in a decrease in short-term memory, that results in a decrease in inattention, and sometimes in judgment and executive functioning. So side effects of surgical treatment. So again, mastectomy versus lumpectomy. There's scar tissue. This can result in limited range of motion in the shoulder. A uh, postural imbalance, because when you think about it, you're re removing weight from one side of your body. So that does change the center of gravity that you're working with while you're walking and talking and moving around. Your um, hypertonic pec musculature, your pec muscle is the first muscle to get weak after a surgery like this. Uh, paresthesia, hypersensitivity, similar to neuropathy, you give it about a year before you see if there's any permanent sensory loss. Uh, we, with therapy, you can kind of um, stimulate the sensory, the nervous system to increase sensory feedback. Uh, Post-surgical swelling, which can possibly lead to lymphedema, more on that in a little bit and impacted day activities of daily living. So yeah, surgery and radiation, it really does take a year to see what permanent changes occurred, depending on how much scar tissue is left over and how much treatment the person went through, the rehab process could be pretty extensive. So continued, we're talking about lymph node removal. Almost every mastectomy, lumpectomy, there is some sort of lymph node involvement. You'll either have a sentinel node, lymph sentinel lymph node biopsy. That is the first one to seven lymph nodes that were removed from the breast in the axillary region. If you go further than that, an axillary lymph node dissection, that's greater than seven lymph nodes removed. And this is very key information. A lot of patients do not remember when I ask them how many lymph nodes are removed, but you'd be surprised how many do. Um, this is a very key piece of information because this alters the course of the therapy. Um, because if I know a patient has more lymph nodes removed, I know they're more at risk for lymphedema and what's called axillary web syndrome. Um, and again, you want to know about the genet genetic history. I've actually had patients who were BRCA positive. They had the gene for breast cancer and they were prophylactically removing their breasts. They had a prophylactic bilateral mastectomy, just in case they developed breast cancer. And then on the surgery table, they ended up finding a tumor. And then the person woke up from their surgery and found out they have to be on maintenance drugs to prevent 
future occurrences. So it is very important to know these things. And also for radiation, you want to know there's a very big difference between three weeks versus six weeks of radiation because that's more treatment. That means there's more time for your skin to get raw and very sensitive and increase scar tissue. All right. So considerations for lymph node removal. So now the patient is at risk for lymphedema, that word that I've been throwing around. It's an abnormal accumulation of swelling in the upper arm. This results in a mechanical breakdown of the lymphatic system, and it's an abnormal accumulation. So when I say mechanical breakdown, I mean, when you think about the nervous system, let's say someone, God forbid, has a stroke of any kind. The brain has a way of rewiring itself, and there's a chance for neuroplasticity to kick in. And so the brain rearranges itself. That is not the case with the lymphatic system. Once there are lymph nodes removed and there is a complication, you there is a mechanical breakdown and the lymphatic system just doesn't compensate for it. And we'll more about that later. And then axillary web syndrome. Now these are two two different conditions that are independent of each other, but they result from lymphatic dysfunction. Now, axillary web syndrome, these are bands of scar tissue that physically limit shoulder range of motion. These are cords, quite literally, they feel like threads. They start in the chest wall and they can extend through the bicep down all the way to the fingers, depending on how severe the case is. Uh, these cords tend to start arising around five to weeks after lymph node removal. And I will say in general, axillary lymph node dissection plus radiation, that increases your risk for lymphedema, and that also increases your risk for axillary web. Okay, so now we know a little bit about the processes. Let's go into the conditions that happen following breast cancer. So cancer-related fatigue is very general problem that occurs. And this is for this is not just breast related. This is more so for the uh, general oncology population, a persistent tense sense of tiredness related to cancer or cancer treatment that interferes with usual functioning. So a greater magnitude and persistence. Breast may not improve symptoms of fatigue. It actually may make it worse if you sit around and you sit, you have live a sedentary lifestyle. Uh, one of the most common and stressful side effects of cancer treatment, again, it's a very general um, side effect. And again, you're thinking about those patients' roles. Uh, one of the biggest things, patients who have a job, a nine to five job, they're working as a banker, or even I have some doctors and they're like, how am I supposed to be on my feet for all this time? I feel tired after 15 minutes. So that's something that we work towards in rehab. So yeah, I want you to see this. Because considering that you met a patient um, pre-radiation, post-radiation, pre-radiation, they still have treatment to go. Post-radiation, they're usually done with treatment. Um, and these are just some common things. And think about how much treatment the patient has to go through. I think it's about a year you're talking about. And at the end of it, they're in so much physical pain, mentally fatigued from all the information they've gathered from all the different doctors they've talked to and worked with. There's a lack of concentration and anxiety in general, and that can also contribute to their attentional deficit, lack of concentration, um, stress, um, having doctors follow you closely for a year, and then all of a sudden you're cancer-free and you only follow up every six months. That can be um, very anxiety-inducing for some of these patients. So you, you want to be very careful with treatment. <clears throat> so this is a picture of a person with lymphedema. This is very typical. I've seen this. I have a lot of patients in my clinic that do that develop lymphedema, and it's mainly because they didn't know that it was possible. So it's, a, again, abnormal accumulation of water and protein. That contributes to the pitting edema that sometimes di doctors diagnose. Pitting refers to if you press your finger into your skin, Normally, your skin bounces back, it retracts very quickly, whereas with pitting edema, your finger creates a pit in your skin. Your skin slows down, it's thicker, and that's what they refer to as a plus pitting or plus plus pitting. Sorry. It is a disease process and a mechanical insufficiency. 
It's diagnosed by rule out, which means that if a patient develops it and has no idea what it is, more often than not, they will go through a ton of different tests before they de decide that, oh, this is probably lymphedema. So you have to rule out everything else before you diagnose it. And unfortunately, it is chronic. So once you have it and you have it at a later stage, you, there's no way to reverse it. You can only um, reduce it and manage it with complex decongestive therapy, which is something that I do. So axillary web syndrome. Again, this is known as axillary cording. These are cord-like structures. They're bands of scar tissue. They inhibit the shoulder and sometimes elbow, wrist, uh, and hand rate of mo range of motion. An audible snap is heard when they're broken. So many times I'll be applying um, myofascial release techniques or just um, manual therapy techniques to these cords, and then I will break them. And then the patient will be like, whoa, what just happened? What did, what did I just hear? What did you break? I'm like, oh, no, that's just a cord. Try moving your arm. And immediately they can move their arm 10 times better. So there is a controversial etiology about this because there are a lot of uh, people who say that, and there's some research saying that um, the cords are lymphatic pathways that are regenerating. However, I found that if you leave them alone and you gently work on them, the patient just gets stiffer and um, can ev eventually develop frozen shoulder because this is a very painful condition. Um, they're tender to touch, it's very inflammatory. So um, uh, un until I see a benefit, a, a clear benefit in the research saying that leaving them alone is the best way to go, I'm gonna keep breaking them because I've never had a patient with a broken cord who said that it hurt them almost 100% of the time they say their range of motion has improved. Okay. And again, I want you to remember, this can be completely independent of lymphedema. It is a dysfunction of the lymphatic system, but it is independent. So the two are not mutually exclusive. Okay, so this is something that a lot of people know more about what can happen with breast cancer. So this is adhesive capsulitis, also known as frozen shoulder. It's all, when you look at this picture, you see there's like a, almost like a bacterial capsule that's, in, that's formed around the humeral head. Um, and it happens due to prolonged immobility of the shoulder girdle. The patient will present with significantly limited range of motion in the scapular region. This can lead, again, hypertonic pec musculature, postural imbalance, pain, limited range of motion, and this reduces shoulder external rotation, internal rotation, and scaption. So I don't know if you guys can see me, but um, that means like putting your hand behind your head, putting your hand behind your back. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, um, <laughs> bringing your arm behind your head, behind your back. So imagine you're not able to do that anymore, and it is very hard to unfreeze a frozen shoulder. Um, the patient normally will have this hard end feel at their limited range, so it takes a long time. Sometimes it's treated with um, steroid injections to relieve the spasms. Um, yeah, it's a very painful thing, so we want to encourage mobility as soon as they finish uh, a surgery. Radiation fibrosis. So this is something after patients who have radiation, typically more in the five to six weeks range of radiation, they um, develop these symptoms where they, it's like darkened skin, uh, skin tenderness, poda orange, which is an orange coloring of the breast, and contracted skin. So you see in these pictures, you can see that it's a bit of a square around the breast. That's because that's the radiation field. They treat almost like they're going straight through the breast and they sometimes these conditions can affect the posterior region, so on your back as well. So this can lead to significantly increased scar tissue. It becomes very tight along the chest wall and the pec area specifically. So patients get a lot of pain in that region. This again can develop as radiation duration increases and it continues to contribute to range of motion deficits. And these symptoms can manifest during radiation, but they also can manifest three to four weeks following completion of radiation. Oh, 
तू पहले खुद बोलती है I'm sorry was that for me Okay all right so you finished all the treatment now people are thinking about reconstructing their breasts you have implant reconstruction versus skin flap reconstruction there are pros and cons to both and you have to think about the patient as a whole think about their age think about what they do for a living think about comorbidities they may have if they're a diabetic person or that they have uh, hypertension or Uh, sensory changes, a skin flap reconstruction might be a little too intense for them. A patient who is younger may be able to tolerate it better. So, with implant reconstruction, there's different types of implants, as you see here. It's preceded by tissue expansion, where they place an expander in and gradually increase it over time, and that's followed by an implant exchange. The body may reject a foreign body, so if your body is not used to it. Um, the implant can be con get contracted and develop a capsular contracture so that is one of the cons to having an implant reconstruction also some patients who have the implant put in prior to radiation which i really hope they don't um can also develop capsular contracture in that way the good thing about implant reconstruction is that there is a quick recovery time but 10 to 14 days less scar tissue but you have to replace them every 5 to 10 years also with them um, there's been more research about textured silicone implants saying that they um might increase your chance for non hodgkin's lymphoma so that's something to think about as well of course so that's implant now when you think about skin flap they these are the two main ones we do at johns hopkins so we do a deep flap or which is at the abdominal wall and the pap which is underneath the buttocks i think at hopkins we call it s gap but in new york we called it the pap reconstruction This is essentially grafting patient skin to recreate breasts. The good thing about this is it's you're using your own skin, so you're, there's no foreign objects, so your body most likely will not reject it. Uh, but there is a chance of it failing, and there is a chance of increased scar tissue, which is where I come in. Uh, if the graft, you want to definitely closely follow it, make sure there is a Doppler done on it every, I want to say, six to eight hours post surgery for the while they're in the hospital. because uh, i have seen some grafts fail and it's very discouraging because this is an extensive surgery it is a one time surgery sometimes with revisions after but it's one time and the good thing is even though there is a longer healing time 2 to 3 months once you do it you're done um so there are pros and cons typically implants if a patient is older and they can't handle 2 3 months of recovery an implant reconstruction might be the less intense way to go uh also you have to think about the comorbidities you also have to think about a patient and their lifestyle if they do not have enough days off from work a skin flap reconstruction is just not feasible at that point um there's also if the patient doesn't have enough fat to graft then it's a, it's harder to create a skin flap reconstruction all right and in the next slide i show you So in breast reconstruction that's a picture a illustration of a tissue expander and then they use a butterfly needle to increase the pressure every so week every couple weeks or so it depends on the plastic surgeon now this can be a very painful process because think about it you're stretching the skin so that when you have that implant exchange you can just throw it right back in to that skin area whereas the deep flap you're seeing they're pulling that superior part of your fat skin and fat and they're displacing it they're moving it to the breast region to create new um breast so you can see there's a big scar that will be created from the skin flap and that's you want to make sure that it's as mobile as possible all right and then sometimes we do have nipple sparing mastectomies as well so there's all different types of ways you can do it um the skin flap reconstruction i have seen very good work and i have seen very poor work um i worked very closely with a doctor in new york city dr oren lerman he works at lenox hill i believe i think he might be starting his own private practice now he had the most remarkable breast reconstructions that you've ever seen it looked like the patient never even had a mastectomy um and it was directly related to the fact that he referred his patients right away to therapy because we addressed the scar tissue as it was happening and therefore his outcomes were much better so all this to say i think 
it's very important to start referring your patients early on to adjust as to address these changes as they happen before they become a permanent problem. All right. So, any questions so far? Ma'am, we can take all the questions at the end. We are getting all of them and we've noted all of them down. We'll just take all of them at the end. That's okay. Okay, that's fine. All right. Yeah. So, and please bear with me. I know this is a lot of information. So, please ask away. I am happy to answer all questions. Okay. So, moving into um, prescribing therapy. So, one of the common complaints I have for patients is that they have too much information and that nobody is listening to them. Uh, my patients, usually they work with the doctors that, that are, they trust the most, um, that actually make them feel like a person. And this is not to knock doctors. I love doctors. My dad is a doctor. <laughs> my mom is a nurse practitioner. I am very well aware of the medical model. However, with this diagnosis, it's a very personal diagnosis. And it's almost like losing a limb when you think about it. Um, patients don't realize how much grieving they do until they lose one of their breasts or they have all that damage to their breasts. And it's a different type of diagnosis. You have to treat it as a, as the whole, as a whole person. And every patient has a unique reaction to treatment, and that is normal. Uh, these are very intense modalities you're using. You're basically going through the body and killing whatever you can to remove the tumor. So I want you to think about the special empathy it takes to handle breast cancer patients. So, yeah. And when you're discussing treatment, and I'm talking about this more from the ND end, uh, you want to know the patient's limitations, uh, restrictions from surgery or treatment, active treatment concerns, when range of motion is no longer restricted or weight training, chemo-induced neuropathy, scar tissue restrictions, lymphedema, medical side effects, other medical conditions. Now, uh, I don't think the doctor needs to tell all of them, all of this to them because usually the therapist will. However, I do think you need to know all of this so that if the patient has questions, they can, um, they, you have the right source of information. Because I will tell you, I have countless patients, and even as much as we're pushing lymphedema treatment in America, there are still tons of patients who come to me and say they wish they knew they, there was breast cancer rehab. Otherwise, they wouldn't be stuck here with all this swelling or all this frozen shoulder that they can't move anymore. So it's very, patient education is extremely important in this setting. So common complaints. So when I'm taking a patient's past medical history and I'm taking their current history for their breast cancer treatment, there are certain phrases I look out for, and these are some of the common things that I hear. So with lymphedema, a patient might say, uh, one arm feels bigger than the other, I can't fit my sleeve, uh, my, my hand feels tight, I can't even make a fist with it, it feels like my skin is getting tight and it's really dull and achy. Uh, those are typical, I, when I hear that, I'm like, oh, they have signs of lymphedema. Axillary web, patients will literally say, their arm feels like it's being pulled down. It feels like there's a string inside my arm, and I don't know how to get rid of it. Um, with paresthesia, they'll say, I can't touch the area. It's numb. Everything hurts. They'll say they have random stabbing pains, or they'll have like itching, but it's itching from the inside, so they can't really reach it. Uh, Cancer-related fatigue. They say, I feel tired all the time. How am I supposed to go back to work? And, and you know it's cancer-related fatigue because they'll say, I'm tired, but the more I rest, the more tired I get. So that's something to think about. Keep in the back of your head. Capsular contracture. This is when implants or tissue expanders, for whatever reason, get stuck on the chest wall, and the a bacterial capsule kind of encapsulates the breast. And people will say, it feels like there's rocks sitting on my chest. Nothing is moving. Uh, Post-surgical complications. I can't sit up straight. These scars feel like they're going to rip. Uh, that's more specifically for someone who had a deep flap reconstruction, which means there is a skin graft from their abdominal wall. Uh, patients are very scared to move. I hear enough stories where patients are like, I was, I was sitting on a recliner. I was sleeping for the last two months on a recliner because I thought that's what I was supposed to do. I was so scared to stand up straight because I didn't want to break anything. Um, 
And, and what ends up happening is they have increased scar tissue, the skin gets contracted, and their posture is very poor. And then now, not only do you have a tight scar across your abdomen, now you have all these postural issues to address. You have all these range of motion issues to address. And now you're farther back than where you started. So exercise recommendations. This is National Cancer Institute's recommendations. Uh, I'm not sure if they've changed within the past year, but from the presentation I did last year, they've been about the same. 2.5 hours of moderate intensity exercise per week or 1.25 hours of vigorous intensity exercise per week. Now I'm gonna to talk to you about restrictions right after this slide. But yeah, typically I tell patients, go for a walk, go for 15, 20 minutes a day, and you will be surprised how much better you feel. I have patients who continued going to the gym through chemotherapy and radiation. Their, their recovery was much quicker and they felt much more like themselves because of that. Exercise really is the best medicine. If there's anything you guys take away from this, it's exercise really is the best medicine. So restrictions. There are two different conflicting post-op restrictions here and they refer to different things. I, in general, say <clears throat> do not lift anything heavier than five to 10 pounds within the first two weeks immediately post-op. For our mastectomy at Johns Hopkins, they say no more, no lifting more than 15 pounds and no shoulder flexion or abduction beyond 90 degrees. When, you're, when a patient has axillary lymph node dissection, which I think I should make clear on the slide, I'm sorry about that. If they have more than seven lymph nodes removed, no lifting with the affected upper extremity for more than eight pounds. Now that is because lifting something heavy can trigger swelling and trigger an onset of lymphedema. I have had patients who come and they say, I was lifting, I was moving my, my stuff from my apartment and I look down and all of a sudden I see a huge amount of swelling in my arm and I don't know how to control it. Um, you take this with a grain of salt. There is ways to come around this. We definitely can't not lift more than eight pounds for the rest of our lives. So we have to work around it and we have to figure out ways to facilitate increased strength training. So that's immediately post-op. After two weeks, you can start seeing doing pain-free active range of motion or active assisted range of motion, which is where I would come in. This is about the time I would like to see patients about 10 to 14 days after their surgery. And, um, yeah, so it's very, very um, lax, very simple exercises in the beginning. Now, three weeks post-op is when we can start working on those scars, given that they are healed at that point. Uh, if there are wounds, if there is wound healing that needs to still occur, sterile strips are still in place, wound drains are still in place, then we do not touch those scars just yet. Uh, if there's stitches, sometimes after about a month, let's say four weeks, if the stitches have not dissolved, sometimes I will go and pull them out. I let the doctor know, of course, but they usually give me free reign to just take out a suture kit and just pull them out. Uh, and nothing happens. They just become, they just, the scar can now fully heal properly. And then six to eight weeks post-op, that's when you can resume weightlifting and abdominal strengthening. And you do it in a progressive manner so that they start low and then you see how their body responds to it not only from a strength standpoint, but also from a lymphedema standpoint. You want to make sure that there's no sw triggering of swelling and you keep going and you progress every week and see how they do. This has worked really nicely, especially in coronavirus. Uh, once patients have progressed to that six to eight weeks post-op period, we can address it via telemedicine. So um, we've been able to continue connecting with our patients in that way, which has been awesome, which I'd love to talk about more later if we can. So lymphedema precautions. I would like patients to know this as soon as possible. Um, we, I do, we do it at Johns Hopkins right before radiation. Uh, we developed a program, a protocol, right before coronavirus that we were rolling out with our head of our radiation department, Dr. Fariba Azrari, uh, where she sends her patients pre-radiation to discuss lymphedema precautions, and what needs to be done and what signs to look out for if they start developing swelling. 
And um, it was working very well. We had grand rounds for it at Hopkins and it was very well received. And then unfortunately with coronavirus, things took a little bit of a halt. So we're still getting that program back up and running, but that is an initiative I've been trying to push for a very, very long time because these are very simple things to remember. So initially you avoid lifting beyond five to 10 pounds. Again, remember we take that with a grain of salt. You wanna keep the skin closed to prevent infection. If the affected upper extremity is red, hot, painful to touch, immediately call your doctor or go to the nearest emergency room for antibiotics. This is because that's possibly a cellulitis infection. Not only can this trigger swelling, but it's also a skin infection and it needs to be treated right away because it can be dangerous if left on its own. Any cuts, bug bites, injections, open skin, just apply antibiotic ointment, cover it up with a Band-Aid. Whenever traveling via airplane, it is beneficial to wear a compression sleeve with glove on your affected upper extremity. Now, there is new research saying that it's not a major cause of lymphedema. However, until I see that it is not a cause of lymphedema, I may suggest it to a patient, especially for the ones that are a little more anxious about developing swelling. Um, I had a patient who was a supermodel, and she was deathly scared of developing lymphedema. And she only had a few lymph nodes removed, but you know what? I would like just wear the compression sleeve. It'll make you feel better. Her arm is part of her livelihood. That's part of her job. So um, she needs to make sure it stays in shape in order to um, do her job. So I got her a compression sleeve with a glove. And the reason traveling via airplane can cause lymphedema is because there is a decrease in cabin pressure. So because of that, the tissue in your skin needs increased pressure to maintain its normal state. That's why when you're on a plane, you normally feel like your feet might swell up. That's because there's a decrease in cabin pressure. All right, so for the MD consult, uh, you prescribe a consult with a certified lymphedema therapist, ideally, or an occupational or physical or physiotherapist who specializes specifically in breast cancer uh, so they can tell the patient about those lymphedema precautions, those post-operative precautions. Now, I understand doctors are very, very busy. Um, if this is too much to add, please send them to rehabilitation so a breast cancer patient can be seen and know all of these things. Um, I find that the doctors that communicate the most are the ones we work very well with. Uh, communication via detailed notes in their chart, uh, prescriptions, emails, that's the best way to do it. I, when I was working in private practice, it was pulling teeth trying to get a patient to tell me their medical history because it induces anxiety. They feel, the patient will feel very anxious when I start asking them questions. They'll say, I don't wanna relive this. I don't wanna, I don't wanna think about it anymore. It's done. I wanna move forward. And which is, I understand that completely, but again, we need to know this information. So many times I was, um, stuck because I didn't have enough communication from a doctor. So all this to say, and I know you guys are all medical students, um, developing a collaborative partnership with your therapist is only going to benefit you in the end. Because like I said, the more you collaborate with a therapist, the better outcomes that you have for your patients, and then they're more grateful. So your satisfaction rating goes up. Okay. So a treatment structure. Typically, like I said before, patients come about 10 to 14 days post-op. They may have drains and sterile strips in place uh, at various points of the care. Sometimes there's still a wound that is healing. I dress it if needed. They typically come for two to three times a week for eight to 10 weeks. This can change based off finances, off of work schedules, off of insurance availability, uh, what is covered, what is not. Um, now, with tel uh, coronavirus, we're doing a hybrid model where we're seeing patients in person and then following up on telehealth and uh, uh, having them come back into the clinic every couple weeks or so. These treatment sessions are typically minimum 30 minutes, maximum about an hour. We start with therapy modalities. We continue on with manual techniques as the scars start to heal, and we transition into an exercise program. And we are monitoring swelling with circumferential measurements, 
We take pretty detailed measurements of the arms to just in case if there is a two centimeter difference between one of the arms, then there is some reason to believe there is swelling and it could lead to lymphedema. So we take measurements about every five centimeters up the arm. So we, we very fine about our measurements. And um, following post-op precautions, we're slowly progressing the patient to weightlifting in the six week following surgery. So there is a progression as we've said before. Okay, so rehabilitation techniques. So this stands for active range of motion, active assisted range of motion, and we move to passive range of motion. That's when you're stretching the patient. Complex decongestive therapy, which I will talk about in the next slide. Soft tissue mobilization, scar tissue management. Myofascial release, is, which is a big thing I do for axillary cording to release them. Sensory desensitization. Um, the scars and the whole surgical areas may be very sensitive to touch, very numb. They may not even feel anything at that point. We have to help re-educate the nerves and the, um, the neurons to um, regenerate and grow maturely. Uh, compression wear, patient education on lymphedema precautions, post-op precautions, lifestyle modifications if needed, modalities, which I will talk about a little more, cognitive rehab, which I'll touch on a little later as well, and progressive weightlifting. So complex decongestive therapy. We typically need to be certified in order to do this. You have to be a certified lymphedema therapist. I was, um, I got my certification in lymphedema therapy in 2017. This includes our main thing is skincare, manual lymphatic drainage, compression wrapping, and decongestive exercises. Now I'll talk about this a little more, I believe in the next slide, what manual lymphatic drainage is. But for your information, these are some resources that you can look into. I put two from the USA. I found the Foldy Clinic in Germany, which all of this rehabilitation has started in Germany. Uh, they were the first ones to detect what lymphedema was, and they have a very, very strict protocol as to how they deal with lymphedema. They have been very proactive, which is awesome. Uh, and I did through a quick Google search, I found the India Lymphedema Foundation. So I know there are resources. I am happy to look for more and share whatever I find because this is a very niche um, type of specialty. So it's very hard to find a lymphedema therapist or um, breast cancer rehabilitation specialist in general. Manual lymphatic drainage. So that key word I wrote in the last slide. This is a massage that we do that stimulates the superficial part of the upper extremity of the skin. We reroute lymph flow from blocked areas into more centrally located healthy areas. We're going from swollen areas to healthy areas. There are different regions of lymph nodes in the body, and that is we reroute fluid to different parts of the body manually. The lymphatic collectors, they increase their contractions by up to 60 contractions per minute. Typically, it's at 15 to 20 at rest, and now with the massage, they'll go up to 60, so it's almost triple the amount. So that's a, a triple the amount of fluid that's circulating throughout your body. And when you think about an intact system, manual lymphatic drainage can counteract inflammatory response mechanisms for post-surgical swelling, abscess washouts, plastic surgeries. Again, we do this a lot with breast cancer, but I found these techniques apply to uh, all different types of surgery. I've done it for knee replacements, hip replacements, um, I had a lot of patients in New York who did plastic surgeries, um, liposuction. I did it for the face, the neck, the legs, for anything, uh, anything that develops swelling. So that is something, it's very universal. Now, I want you to see this picture because this is what we have to put on our patient. We have to wrap them with a series of short stretch bandages. They look like ACE bandages, but they are, they work a little differently. They have a higher working pressure to continue moving fluid throughout the body and up and out the arm. Now, this continues supporting the effects of manual lymphatic drainage. We are creating a graduated pressure gradient, high to low, starting from distal to proximal, and you overlap the bandages by 50%. Now, I want you guys to take a look at this because this is for patients who are go undergoing treatment 
who have lymphedema. Now, again, we've said before, lymphedema is chronic. There is no cure. Now imagine wearing this for the rest of your life, pretty much. Um, maybe you'll wear it for a portion of the year with insurance and then maintain it. And then you have to come back the next year and do this all over again. And this is about three or four layers, including that's three or four layers of bandages. That's cotton. That's a stockinette. That's um, finger gauze. Uh, that could be extra padding and foam, depending on how severe the lymphedema is. And now imagine wearing that in the summertime or in India where it's hot all year round. It's it's very annoying for the patient. And it's the gift that keeps on giving because patients see this and it's a constant reminder that they had breast cancer and that they were stuck with breast cancer. So if we can avoid this, if we can try and get the patient educated, we can get them uh, to a higher level with their therapy, and we can avoid this altogether. Um, because if you catch lymphedema early enough, you can reverse it. But more often than not, you find a patient develops swelling, and you're like, oh, man, they're not going to be able to get back exactly to normal. We can reduce it. We can maintain it. But there is no cure. So back to axillary cording or axillary web syndrome. This, I've said before, there's immediate pain relief when the cords are broken, and you can see an instant improvement in active range of motion. I like to work at the vantage points uh, in the axilla, or I like to work in the cubital fossa or the fingertips. I actually, in this picture, you can see there's cords running through the patient's elbow. That's making her compensate for her shoulder abduction. She's hiking her shoulder up a little bit. And um, when you break them, it's actually a very <laughs> gratifying feeling because it, it snaps audibly and it's broken using myofascial release and traction techniques. So I'm working perpendicular to the cord to break it. And again, research is conflicting. There's very little research about this. There's not even a diagnostic code in, for insurance purposes for this, um, but it is something that occurs very often, a patient who had axillary lymph nodes mo removed, most likely did develop some cording of some sort. So we have to deal with it head on. Uh, I am more aggressive in my approach. Some people are not, and we usually get the same results. But I find that if you break them, the patient immediately feels better. I bet if this patient broke all those cords, she'd be able to lift her arm over her head, no problem. All right. I think we're almost, we're, we're getting there. So, beating fatigue, your exercise program. We are focusing closely on shoulder stabilizers and the postural muscles, because those are the muscles and that's the area of the body that's affected by all this treatment that we have. You're addressing posture. There's, again, posture is everything <laughs> with breast cancer. Uh, my doctoral capstone was on how postural posture can be changed with breast cancer rehab. Uh, block burn exercises are very important. These are exercises where you lay prone and you have direct, uh, gravity directly hitting the muscle. So you get the best bang for your buck with just 10 or 15 reps of lifting your arms up and back and then bringing it back down. Uh, you're strengthening your shoulder stabilizers, your back stabilizers, um, your traps, lower traps, mid traps, that kind of stuff. You're maintaining range of motion in the shoulders. Uh, there's a home exercise program we give our patients to improve active range of motion before we can go into strengthening. Uh, energy conservation principles. Now, these are tips that we give our patients, which you would think are pretty common sense, but it's one of those things that you tell the patient and they're like, ah, oh, I never even thought of that. Uh, one example could be I tell patients while they're cooking, especially my Indian patients who are cooking curries and whatever for hours and hours of the day, uh, bring a stool and sit on it while you're sitting there watching the curry simmer. Um, and they think, and at first you think, oh, that's a very simple technique, but you don't think about it until you actually do it. You're like, oh, that's a very good idea. Um, bringing things off the shelves from the high shelves to the lower shelves, a simple thing, but it makes a huge difference on the patient's capacity. Um, so yeah, these are things that we, we have tip sheets that we give our patients about energy conservation. Uh, progressive weight training. Again, we've talked about that before. You gradually build up every week. 
see how the patient does. If they have lymphedema or they're at risk, we make them wear compression while they're doing exercises. And we like to push yoga and Pilates because there's a lot of breast cancer um, specific programs uh, with yoga and Pilates. The nice thing about both of these exercises and these art forms is that you are stretching, you are contracting the muscles, so you're strengthening them, but you're also lengthening them at the same time. So you're strengthening, but you're also improving range of motion at the same time. And you also get great mental benefits from this. Um, patients have to deal with a lot of anxiety. And so this is a very holistic kind of exercise to help get the patient back to feeling normal or a new normal. So modalities. So by modalities, I mean, these are different devices that we use sometimes in therapy. So intermittent pneumatic compression, that lady who is wearing the gray sleeve with the trunk piece, that is a compression pump, a simpler term. It's a device meant to imitate lymphatic drainage and facilitate healthy lymphatics. This has become very key in the time of coronavirus. We usually prescribe this to patients. Insurance almost always covers it for at least 90%. And um, we have patients have this at home. This is the second best thing to getting um, manual lymphatic drainage without um, coming into the clinic. So we would meet patients via telemedicine and we'd have them get it prescribed and we'd have the, the company go to their home and set it up for them. Uh, it's very relaxing. It's a massage for your body uh, given whatever treatment area you do. Uh, I've actually gotten one for people in my family who had swelling issues and they love it. Uh, compression sleeves, again, that is a picture taken from a site. Uh, this company is called Lymphadivas. <laughs> so they uh, very pride, they pride themselves on compression sleeves that are very pretty. The, a lot of different patterns. Um, this is, I think, a henna sleeve or a Mandy sleeve. I don't know. But um, there's a lot with tattoo art, uh, different signs. Some look like lace. There's all sorts of different sleeves. And this is something that my patients really do love but they facilitate lymphatic flow with increased activity. So that's why you wanna wear them when you're exercising or when you're flying. The next modalities, lymphotouch. So this is the gray suctioning cup you see this man doing on this woman. So this is a negative pressure device. It provides skin traction and it improves circulation. So you're providing that negative pressure and you are facilitating that circulation, that lymphatic flow. I like this because this gives me a little um, break on my hands because my hands can get tired by the end of the week. But you get some, you get a good grip on the skin, especially that tight, those tight adhesions, especially with radiation as along the chest wall. This is a great way to um, try and lift the skin and increase elasticity and movement. Now, kinesio tape. This is the lovely pink and blue patterns you see here. This lifts the skin to mimic lymphatic system, and it can also aid in muscle stabilization. So the patterns that you see here are um, to relieve swelling in the arm. I do this a lot. I do this not only for breast cancer patients. I do this for patients who have um, uh, different uh, distal radius fractures or orthopedic issues as well. This is good for patients who also have breast swelling. I forgot to mention lymphedema can also happen in the breast and the trunk. So when you can't wrap a trunk or a breast, these are the best ways to combat the swelling. Now cognitive treatment. This is a little harder to conceptualize. I am still working on ways to um, standardize the way we do cognitive treatment at Hopkins. This is again typically addressing brain fog. So we're talking about structuring the patient's routines so they are on a, you're keeping them accountable for keeping a routine, a schedule. And um, this is something we deal with, with medication management. So with breast cancer treatment, there's a lot of medications you may or may not need to take. Um, but if you have a short-term memory deficit, if you have an inattention deficit, if your executive functioning is not quite up to speed, then you need some comp compensatory techniques in order to manage your medications and keep you safe at home. Uh, we have a lot of technology at Hopkins, which is one of the best things we've been able to um, get at the hospital. 
we have a lot of virtual reality devices to uh, address cognitive rehabilitation. And um, these are a lot, there's other times where it's just a simple paper and pen task, a reading comprehension task. Uh, you're addressing short-term memory and attention to tasks for the most part. Okay. And also before I keep going, I think I only have a few more slides. Please bear with me. Uh, we also are doing some new and some new exciting treatments at Hopkins. We're doing um, with therapy for axillary web. So that's something I hope to talk about more in the future. So for psychosocial considerations, this is something I want you guys to know um, patients deal with because it's very important. Anxiety of the unknown, body dysmorphia, information overload, poor sleep, sexual dysfunction, anxiety of the unknown. I've touched on this earlier, but when you have a patient who has been followed for about a year very closely by a medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, surgical oncologist, um, a therapist, we have so many things happening. Uh, plastic surgery. There's so many doctors following you and you cannot keep up with a doctor's appointment, but then finally finish that course of radiation and then all of a sudden you're cancer free and then what happens? So it's very important to acknowledge that and to acknowledge these patients have a lot of anxiety. It's like these doctors are following me for so long and now I'm just expected to be like, okay, I'm fine. Like I don't need an MRI. I don't need a CAT scan. I don't need to, you know, so that is something to think about. Um, body dysmorphia, again, losing a breast is almost as if you're losing a limb. I did not quite understand that until I started working in breast cancer. These women and men, they mourn the loss of losing a limb. Uh, and if it's, it's very personal and it really leaves the patient in a low state, a low emotional mindset. So you have to help empower the patient information overload that is like we've said before these patients are getting a ton of information all at once a lot of patients don't even know what we're talking about so we have to present it in a way where they can understand their health literacy is up to speed with us um one of the one main things actually a hospital nearby they did a very interesting thing they give all their breast cancer patients a notebook and a pen and for some reason, this has been a, a God, God's gift to the world because these patients are able to write down everything the doctors say and they bring it to all their appointments and the doctors make sure that they bring it so that they can write all their information down. And it, this is a very small intervention and I didn't even think this would be that impactful, but I cannot tell you how many patients are so happy that they have that notebook because then they can go home at night and actually process the information that's being given to them and actually feel like they're informed about the treatment that's taking over their body. Uh, poor sleep. When you have anxiety, uh, we are all guilty of it, especially now. You have anxiety over the future. You have anxiety of possibly developing breast cancer. You're thinking you're reliving poor memories of what has happened to you. That will, that will result in poor sleep. I put a couple sleep hygiene techniques here. Again, these seem very simple, but unless you call it out and say it to the patient, it's harder to um, put it into practice. Avoiding long naps, uh, sleep only as much as you need to feel rested the next day. Avoid watching the clock, um, exercising regularly. When you exercise regularly, it's, it's interesting because patients will say, I need to rest, I'm so tired, and I'm like, I tell them, like, this is why you're tired, because you're resting all the time. Uh, that is across every specialty in therapy. But the more you rest, the more tired you get. It's a vicious cycle. So you want to get them up and moving. The last thing I'll touch on is sexual dysfunction. Uh, a lot of patients are put induced into induced menopause. Um, and this is hard. The younger the patients get, the sadder it is. You think about the younger patients. I have patients in there. The youngest patient I had was 24. Uh, I've heard about patients who were 16, 18, getting breast cancer. Uh, and now going into menopause when you're 18, imagine all the hormonal changes. Your hormones already are still maturing. And then all of this happens. So it's not something to take lightly. Their sexual dysfunction is a very big part of what we do.
<clears throat> and yeah, so thinking about that, thinking about patients who want to have children, who want to, um, they do IVF treatments if their insurance or their finances allow it, which um, increase fertility, they can um, get their eggs frozen. That's a conversation you kind of have to have early on with the patient if they're interested in doing that, if they want to have children in the future. Because like I said, the diagnoses are getting younger and younger, which is alarming, but these are things we have to start thinking about. I think this is my last slide. Oh no, we have a couple more, I'm sorry. So for the metastatic patient, our main goal is to focus on decreasing pain. So now we're not thinking about getting them exercising up and moving again. We're not trying to get them back to their normal lives because we know their lives have changed significantly. Um, we do what they would like to do. We decrease the pain and we preserve their upper extremity function. We deal a lot with positioning. Patients who are metastatic tend to have significantly increased swelling in their arm. And when they do, it's a tricky situation because you do not want to do a massage that circulates more metastatic, metastatic cancer, God forbid. So you have to reroute and think differently about how you would treat the patient. Um, and you proceed with caution at all times. And sometimes the metastases will manifest on the skin. And then you have to think about wound care. Um, I have a story about a patient of mine recently who was in his 80s and um, he had metastatic breast cancer. He was a male. And he, the only appointment he liked going to was his lymphedema therapy appointments. Uh, I started noticing that there was a rash on his skin and I, and his skin was so swollen at this point, And I thought, you know, this is a very skinny gentleman. I, I had a feeling it was metastases. And I told him, I was like, you know, maybe you should just go check this out. If not a dermatologist, maybe just your oncologist, just take a look. It may be nothing, but I think you should go look. And the doctor told him they were skin metastases. And his new prognosis was only a few months left. And had we not caught that, he would have thought he was living for the next few years. Um, and I talked to him about continuing lymphedema therapy. I'm like, this is starting to take over your arm. And he told me, he's like, I have a few months left to live. And I want to, this is the only thing that gives me, that makes me feel okay. This is the only thing that makes me feel better. Um, he is a model airplane builder, or he was. And um, when I got the swelling out of his hand, he was able to, continue building model airplanes in his age. So um, unfortunately, he passed away a few months, few weeks after that, actually. Um, but he was very adamant that this was the one thing that made him feel better. So it's something to think about with your patients. Again, we're, we're looking at increasing their functional capacity, but you also want to think about what the patient's goal is, too. This is a direct quote out of a study recently. There are many studies out there showing the benefits of activity for breast cancer survivors. On average, there's about 33 to 40% reduction in breast cancer specific mortality with physical exercise. Now that is a very significant number. Um, and I think this could probably translate across more cancer diagnoses. Uh, exercise really is the best medicine. Um, I'll say something personal, my dad has prostate cancer. And me and my sister and my mom are constantly telling him to just go outside and take a walk for 20 minutes a day because you will see such a big difference as you deal with treatment. Patient education. So again, just kind of wrapping everything up. You want to build a rapport with your patient. This is a very uh, personal diagnosis. So you want to look at the patient as a person. You want to think about their hormone changes and what this means for the rest of their lives. You want to talk about energy conservation and how to get back to who they were prior to all this. Uh, their sexual health, you want to talk about that and what that means for them, what options are available for them. And you mainly want to empower the patient with information regarding their treatment. I find written handouts are much easier to give and they help the patient a lot more versus verbalizing or a mix of both, definitely written handouts help. Uh, giving them a home exercise program to start, 
uh, teaching them sustainable practices of active living. And most importantly, you want to focus on how far the patient has come. I meet patients right before, usually right before they did radiation and right after they had surgery. And when I meet them, you think, wow, this patient has already gone most likely through six months of chemotherapy and just had an extensive surgery and they are handling it so well. So you really want to focus on that. And then if I see them before radiation, I tell them, I'm like, you're in the home stretch now. Like, here it is. We're almost there. Um, just keep trekking on a little bit longer. And they see, and patients respond to that. They, they can tell a difference between when you're listening and when you're just kind of dismissing them. So I, I think, if anything, the most important thing is to build that rapport with the patient. I think that is our last slide, Priyanka, Simran. So any questions? Uh, yes, ma'am. We have had a flood of questions. Okay, great. So, <laughs> the first question is, why does lymphedema develop only after breast cancer surgery and not any other surgery? Because there is a lymph node removal. So if you have a healthy, intact lymphatic system, there's no reason to believe you'll develop swelling. Um, sometimes, and this is unrelated to breast cancer, uh, you are born with a very sluggish lymphatic system, so you start developing swelling in your legs. That is primary lymphedema. With breast cancer, there is a mechanical breakdown in the system. You have lymph nodes removed from a certain area, therefore there's less lymph nodes moving through it. Therefore, that's secondary lymphedema. So that is what breast cancer patients typically deal with. Okay, great. Uh, what are the chances of angiosarcoma due to lymphedema? Very rare. I think I've only seen one patient with angiosarcoma. Um, they are, but if they do have angiosarcoma, unless it's removed, I cannot work on them. So, but I do not have an exact statistic about um, what the chances are. What are the uh, average percentage of women post-surgery that develop lymphedema and axillary webs? Can you say that one more time? Approximately what percentage of women develop uh, lymphedema and axillary webs post-surgery? I want to say, I don't have a specific statistic, but if I was to say it, for every five patients, I want to say four of them develop cording. That's a huge number. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is the decompressive therapy for lymphedema? So for the decompressive therapy, that's complex decongestive therapy. And I'll roll back to some of my slides on that. I can move this fast. I don't think I can. OK, we're just going to, I'll just say it out loud. Hold on. So the decongestive, de, so it's decongestive ex, uh, therapy. We are compressing the limb. We are providing pressure, light pressure as a massage to move the fluid because the lymphatic system is superficial, very superficial on the skin. So we're stimulating the lymphatics to move fluid quicker. And then once we do that, we have the patient wrapped with compression wrapping. So that continues, and they have a higher working pressure, that continues the movement of fluid out of the arm. Now, the manual massage on its own will only last, the effects will last maybe 20 to 30 minutes before your lymphatic system slows down again. So that's why the compression wrapping is such an important component, because the longer you wear that wrap, the longer the fluid will continue to move at that rate. Okay, thank you, um, How do we manage stage three lymphedema and does weight training specifically help you? Breast cancer, so a stage three lymphedema, it's not as, um, common in breast cancer patients. I find stage three lymphedema is more for patients with primary in the legs. Um, that's when you start to see like the fibrosis, uh, the skin gets harder and you see there's ulcers sometimes. I very rarely get that with a patient, but if I, mostly, I'm gonna say this as a football leg patient, you are pushing a lot harder to move that skin. You do a lot more modalities. Um, we do a lot of shockwave therapy. Um, we use that lymph touch, that physio touch that I showed that gives a negative pressure to get a grip on the skin. And I work closely with wound care to address those ulcers prior to running. So um, very rare in breast cancer because it's it's more visible in the arm. I feel like people address it quicker, but um, I definitely had to deal with stage three in the legs. Before. 
Ma'am, in case there is a patient with lymphedema, do we have any specific drug history to be known? A specific job history? Drug history. Drug history. Um, no, there there is no cure or there's no drug for lymphedema or anything that triggers it. I find that some patients will have been prescribed um, Lasix, uh, like a water pill to decrease the swelling, and that's usually from a volume overload in general to the entire body. Um, if the patient had Lasix and um, didn't feel some swelling, that's most likely some lymphatic swelling going on after their course is done. Um, breast cancer related, not necessarily, but if I read the chart and I see that they had chemotherapy of any kind, I see they had radiation, I see they had lymph node removal, that's like the key thing. I'll think, okay, there's a couple things here that may have caused the swelling. So, yeah. Okay, so that gives that answer. In case the skin flap fails, what is the management? Yeah, so that has happened. Unfortunately, that, that results in a revision of the surgery. Um, the surgery, it's really important to check the flap and make sure it's keeping. Check a Doppler, make sure it's the ultrasound is working. It is there is movement and activity in that flap. Very you want to check it very closely. Um, I have had that happen. And they came, the patient would come to me and I'd feel like a hard rock in their reconstruction. And I'd be like, this is not scar tissue, because with scar tissue, you feel it start to soften up. But with necrosis, fat necrosis, it's a very hard feel. So it ends up in a revision or they have to graft more skin, unfortunately. Um, what about tram flaps? Are they used? Tram flaps are outdated in the in America. Um, the reason being they take muscle flaps from the lower belly and that resulted in a lot of lower back pain in patients. I have seen some tram flaps, but they're from patients who had them like years ago um, when they were still like in. So now people are um, pivoting more to the deep flap now uh if lymphedema is left untreated would it resolve itself or is it going to worsen if it's at a very early stage very early where you may only just feel the pain and not necessarily a visible difference there is a chance however that is a very low chance um, if you have the swelling most likely it will just get worse and may lead to an infection and you will have to come to therapy anyway because there is no cure, unfortunately. Um, so how long would it take for the lymphedema to resolve? So it doesn't resolve, but we reduce the swelling as much as we can. Um, typically, I give the patients about two months. Um, it's an intensive therapy, too. So it's three times a week minimum. Um, the patient is pretty much wrapped the entire time. I tell them to wear the wrap from the last session to the next session. and it's a pretty intensive process. So I would say about, I would say two to three months before I see like a plateauing measurement. Uh, in addition to the manual lymphatic drainage, uh -huh. what more do you suggest should be done to manage lymphedema? You know, um, to manage lymphedema? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, so the manual lymphatic drainage is very key in handling it. You could learn how to do self-massage, uh, self-drainage. There are, but take that with a grain of salt because I know there's a lot of um, products on the market that are saying that they increase lymphatic drainage. Um, I, I know jade rollers, ice rollers, um, dry brushing is a big one that I've heard of, Epsom salt baths, which uh, I mean, they're all great, but they are not lymphatic drainage. They, that is not what it is. So um, there's a very clear, distinct difference between what I do and what those products do. Um, yeah, if, sometimes I'll have patients, if they're very worried and they have a lot of radiation coming up, I'll get them a compression pump uh, prophylactically, and I'll get them uh, a compression sleeve just to stay on the safe side. Uh, what, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Are there as many complications to a prophylactic mastectomy as there is in therapeutic mastectomy? So a prophylactic mastectomy, you don't have that lymphedema risk because there shouldn't be any lymph node involvement if it's a prophylactic mastectomy. So you don't mm -hmm. have to worry about your risk. But prophylactic, you still are at risk for frozen shoulder and you're still at risk for um, 
uh, scar tissue and skin tightness and adhesions in the chest wall. Uh, can parotism under pressure be given for upper limb swelling? Can you say that one more time? Can parotism under pressure be given for upper limb swelling? What is parotism? Ma'am, I've just got the question. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm not quite. I think. I think there might be a typo. I will ask the participant to mail you the question. Yeah, please. I don't know where it is. <laughs> What causes axillary cording? Axillary cording. So when you have lymph nodes dissected at all, um, even in the sentinel lymph node, whatever, the etiology is very unclear, but this is what we've come to understand at Hopkins is it seems as though it's scar tissue buildup. Because if you have lymph nodes removed, the, the system doesn't rewire itself. Instead, the lymph nodes, they just leave behind dead vessels. And I, I feel those dead vessels create scar tissue. And those scar tissues develop bands in your arm and they create clothing. Mom, can you describe myofascial release in a bit of a detail? So myofascial release is kind of where I hold, I, I'm on the muscle belly. Um, is this in terms of muscle or um, axillary cording or just in general? I'm just in general. Okay, so in general, you would, um, it's almost like doing a trigger point release where you hold down on the muscle and kind of apply pressure, even pressure until you feel a release in the muscle tension. Um, for axillary cording, I do similar techniques. I hold my hands per uh, perpendicular to the cording um, and I provide a lot of traction to kind of break, pretty much manually break the web. And um, more often than not, the web breaks and the patient feels much better. <laughs> And what virtual setups are used to help patients with brain fog? So we have quite a few here. I w I, if I had more time, I could show you. Um, if I was at my office, I'm at home right now. Um, we have tons of devices. We have um, the bits, which is, uh, I forgot what it stood for, but it's a big screen. And there are a ton of things you can do. There's a new one we have. It's called the Mind Motion Go. And it's a virtual reality device. We've been using this with coronavirus patients as well um, to increase um, cognitive um, function. There's a Mind Motion Go. There is um, the Dolphin. It's a virtual reality. It's almost like you're playing a video game, but it's to increase um, return in your arm function. Um, but it also is like a big test in testing your cognitive limits and your attention to tasks. So. Um, what is lymphangiomotoricity? Lymphangiomotoricity, I'm sorry, I didn't say that word correctly in the slide. Um, that is a rate of lymphatic collector contractions. So your lymphatics, the earliest stage, the earliest, the first point is of entry is the lymphatic collectors. And they're the ones that um, increase, um, take in the fluid. So lymphangiomotoricity is the movement of those lymphatic collectors. What's the effectiveness of compression sleeves as compared to compression wrapping? Compression wrapping is definitely better. What I like to compare is um, compression wrapping continues the process. It continues moving fluid, whereas a compression sleeve pretty much keeps things stable. So you kind of keep things where they are. Um, so what I have patients do is if they do have lymphedema, I will work with them for about two to three months until their measurements plateau. And then once they are at their most reduced state, then I'll get a compression sleeve for them. So that's what the sleeves do. And then I get them measured, and then they wear that to stabilize it. Um, we know that radiation fibrosis is because of the exposure to radiation. So is there any way to prevent it or completely stop it? Yeah, so I tell a lot of my patients, and doctors are pretty good about telling their patients this too, I tell them moisturize the area twice a day um, with a very thick uh, breathing lotion. I don't. Do you guys have Aquaphor over there in India? No, I'm not sure. It's um similar to like paraffin, but it's a little. Um, it's like a medical grade kind of paraffin. Um, it's very thick, and I like that for my patients. Um, and I tell them to massage the area very gently every day, just to increase some um, elasticity in the skin. Um, just the tolerance. 
Yeah. yeah, and sometimes if a patient has a lumpectomy and they just have a portion of their breast removed, I might suggest wearing like a compression bra, like a sports bra, to um, uh, provide compression to the area. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Um, last two questions. Yeah. Is elevated preoperative plasma fibrinogen predictor of a poor prognosis, and is it a valuable parameter for risk assessment? Can you say that one more time? I'm sorry. Is elevated preoperative plasma fibrinogen a predictor of poor prognosis, and is it a valuable parameter for risk assessment? Um, no, not necessarily. Um, uh, it's not, it doesn't really get down to the very microbiological um, uh, parameters. It's more so, I think, a higher predictor of a successful outcome is the age of a patient. Um, if they're older, will they be able to tolerate uh, extensive procedures like this. Um, comorbidities, they're healing. If they are diabetic, they have a very slow healing process. They take significantly longer. Um, if they had cancer in the past, if this is a recurrence, if they already had radiation, then you know there's already some damage. So they are most likely prone to more damage that's happening. Um, but yeah, from a microbiological standpoint, that's not in therapy, that's not much of an indicator of whether the prognosis is better or worse. And one last question: How would you treat a patient of lymph? How would you treat lymphedema in a metastatic patient? So you avoid the areas with met metastases, with known metastases. So if I had a patient with right upper extremity lymphedema, instead of sending, instead of um, this is a this is a loaded question. So I stimulate the lymph node regions, except all the lymph node regions in the body. So there's two: you have your axillas. And then you have in your inguinal, your pelvic areas, and your abdomen. So I would stimulate those areas, but I probably wouldn't open any pathways to the metastatic region, mainly because you don't want to increase Smith's metastatic flow. Um, so I focus more on opening up. I do some deep breathing with the patient uh, to stimulate. There's a This is, again, a whole other lecture I could do, but um, an abdominal duct in your body that increases um, lymphatic return. So if you do some deep breathing with a textbook on your belly, that'll actually increase lymphatic return. So I do that. Um, and I just work directly on the arm. Uh, generally, if a patient has metastases and they have a far gone lymphedema, we're focusing more on um, softening the skin because the skin has already become hard with the protein buildup. So I'm focusing more on that and comfort for the patient because that can make the skin tight and uncomfortable. Um, yeah, but you base generally want to avoid the lymph, the metas metastatic region. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Any other questions, we'll mail them to you so that we can give the mails to the participant also. I'd like to invite Simran back with us. Mm -hmm. Hi, Simran. Hi. Thank you so much, ma'am, for agreeing to do this with us. It was an amazing session, and I hope everyone really liked it. Yeah. Please send your feedback to us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I would love to do this again if you guys want me to. So it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah. So we can conclude our session over here. Ma'am, if there's anything that you would like to tell us, please go ahead. So I have my last slide. I think it's to get connected. Oh, those are my references. And then my last slide is to get connected. So if you guys do want to follow me or if you have any questions, these are actually like my personal email and my LinkedIn and Instagram, but I really, there's no difference between my professional and my, my personal, everything else. Oh, um, so yeah, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, I'm happy to talk more or if, you're, if you want to pick my brain a bit, more than happy to. Mom, you've got some amazing feedbacks in the chat box. You can check that out. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you guys had fun. I hope you guys um, learned a few things about um, breast cancer rehabilitation. Yes, ma'am. It was a great lecture. It was so much fun to attend. Thank you. I'm glad to hear it. Happy to do it again if you guys need. <laughs> Uh, so all the participants, we have our post event form that we have put up here in the link. Please fill it and give us your feedbacks. Thank you so much.
right. I think we can end the deal. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. No problem. You can just close the tab. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I'm just looking at the um, comments. <laughs> oh, no. Thank you. The link up to the post event form has been posted in this chat box itself. Uh, we'll also send the post event form on the WhatsApp group. So let's just uh, end this event right now. And we'll send the link to you on the groups as well. Thank you so much for attending our event.